Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab, all on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Jude Blanchett, and I'm the Freeman Chair in China Studies here at CSIS. Uh, I'm pleased to uh, have joining us today Hal Brands, who is the Henry Kissinger Distinguished Professor of Global Affairs at Johns Hopkins SAIS. And I think everyone here will have read uh, many of Hal's prodigious writings. Uh, previous books include What, is Grand what Good is Grand Strategy? Power and Purpose, an American Statecraft from Harry Truman to George W. Bush, American Grand Strategy in the Age of Trump, uh, and The Lessons of Tragedy, Statecraft and World Order, which he co-authored with our CSIS colleague, uh, Charlie Dell. But today I'm really thrilled to have Hal here to talk about his important new book entitled Twilight Struggle, What the Cold War Teaches Us, a Great Power Rivalry Today, which was just published by Yale University Press. Hal, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. So uh, I, this couldn't be better timing for the book, um, which I'm sure was intentional. Uh, but um, I wanted to start out with just a general question, which is we seem to be in this debate right now about the nature of our relationship with China. And over the past two weeks, our relationship with China and Russia, there seem to be two camps looking at this. One is uh, wanting this to be a Cold War or not wanting this to be a Cold War, sort of a proscriptive view on the relationship, and then there are others who look at this maybe more diagnostically. Does this rhyme with or have enough overlap with the original Cold War that this framing um, of a Cold War-like long-term strategic competition makes sense? And so before we get into the guts of your book, just on that top line, do you see the relationship with China as a capital C Cold War II, or do you see it as a small C Cold War? So I guess I'm trying to intervene in that debate, but also move beyond it a little bit. And so I, I would say that the U.S.-China rivalry is kind of a kind of a lower sea Cold War in the sense that there are so many obvious differences between the U.S.-China rivalry and the U.S.-Soviet rivalry that calling it Cold War II and, and it sort of giving the implication that the similarities are, are profound probably risks misleading us. And so just to give the example that everybody's familiar with, the degree of economic interlinkage between the United States and its allies in China is just so much greater and more complex uh, today than it was vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Soviet Union during the Cold War. So, so the differences are, are significant, but the, the point that I try to make in, in my writings is that uh, Cold Wars are really nothing unusual if you use sort of the lower C uh, meaning of the term. And so uh, long-term rivalries between geopolitical and ideological antagonists are basically as old as recorded history. The Cold War was one manifestation of this. The U.S.-China rivalry is another manifestation uh, of this. And so presumably we can learn something about our present problems by looking back at this previous rivalry. And this is where kind of getting past the debate becomes so important. I, I think we sometimes get so caught up in the question of is this a new Cold War that we don't really go deep in trying to learn the lessons of the old Cold War. And, and so. Uh, I would say that American officials, American politicians are going to reference the U.S.-Soviet Cold War mentally in thinking about the U.S.-China Cold War, whether or not it's a good analogy. It's, it's the one time in America's history that we have done this sort of thing, a multi-decade competition with an authoritarian rival. And it's within the living memory of a lot of people who make policy in the United States today. And so let's sort of start arguing about whether this is a new Cold War and, and go back and try to figure out what the old Cold War can teach us about long-term rivalry. And you know, I'm struck when I read many of the pieces in that first wave of this debate a couple of years ago, which were many written by you know, prominent Cold War historians who were saying, of course, this is not a Cold War. And their argument boiled down to it's different. And um, I thought I was always with them in their analysis up, up till the point where they started to talk about modern day China. And, and there it felt like the China in their head was the China of the mid 1990s. And it, it, it is striking to me, um, especially with China's political system turning inward and the opacity rising in the system, I find I'm profiting more by reading about 
elements of the Soviet Union and dynamics of leadership within the Soviet Union than I am looking at other comparative examples. And, and I think there's something important in, in, in that. Um, what are the, you know, building on from this analysis that, that you make, which is there's a lot we can learn from the Cold War if this is not necessarily, you know, an exact replication of it. In thinking about the ways in which Beijing and Moscow um, are similar and differ, one of the striking examples of China, I think, especially in the Xi Jinping period, is how expansive its ambitions are. They're different than the Soviet ambitions. I, I think we see this as less ideological to some extent than, than we did Moscow. Um, but you, I, you were talking about in a, I saw you in a previous interview, I think making the good point that for the United States, one of the lessons we learned from World War II and then the Cold War was you often had to go out and meet some of these security challenges, often in faraway places, um, because they would come find you, or at least they would interrupt the, the international order as such that, that this um, threatened U.S. stability and prosperity at home. Um, it strikes me that Beijing is coming to much the same realization now, and maybe this is one of the motivators behind its um, moving away from a, a hide and bide style foreign strategy. And when you look at the way Xi Jinping talks about national security, he's saying explicitly there are no demarcations between internal and, and, and external. So um, seeing this is not a replication of the Cold War, but nonetheless, how would you define and think about Beijing's security interests? How should U.S. policymakers think about China's security interests? And I think maybe the most difficult question, possibly politically, is what are Beijing's legitimate security interests that we should be um, thinking about when we conceive of a strategy? Yeah, that, that is a good question. And in some ways, what China is doing is the least surprising thing in the world. And so great powers typically have an interest or a compulsion to make the international system more to their liking and, and more congenial to the functioning of their domestic political system. I mean, the United States has done this, the United Kingdom did this, and China is doing it right now. I think there are significant debates still within the community of sinologists and people who do strategic studies about exactly how far China's ambitions expand. I, I think there's emerged you know, pretty good evidence that China aspires to be the number one power in Asia, which, which probably means a pretty severely circumscribed U.S. role in the region. And I think that uh, the Chinese leadership and Chinese uh, state media have become less and less uh, ambiguous about describing China's global objectives as, as well. And so I think it is probably safe. Uh, I feel confident in saying, although I know that not everyone would agree, that China probably aspires to be the most powerful country in the world two or three decades from now and, and have an international system that looks considerably different as a consequence uh, of that. Although I'm not sure that Chinese leaders could give you an exact description of what uh, a Sinocentric international system would look like. On the question of, you know, does China have legitimate security interests? Uh, of course, in the same way that, that every country has legitimate security interests of one sort uh, or another. And so if uh, China, China has a legitimate security interest in ensuring that it is not um, invaded and ravaged by uh, a neighbor in the way that it was during the 1930s uh, with Japan. Uh, it has other legitimate security interests in that vein. If that security interest is then extended to having a veto over Japanese foreign policy so that Japan cannot align with the United States and thereby maintain a favorable balance of power into the Western Pacific, I think that's a far more questionable proposition whether that is a legitimate security interest. And certainly that's the point at which Chinese interests start to overlap in, in pretty, um, uh, pretty severe ways with those of the United States. Um, the Soviet Union watched in real time the growth of um, and developments of U.S. Cold War strategy, including the distribution and growth of U.S. power overseas. China inherited it. Right, China it comes in as a great power, looking out at this array of U.S. forces and capabilities right up in its neighborhood. Um, that's the, the puzzle that I have a trouble thinking through, is we, we, putting ourselves in the shoes of Beijing, um, they look out and they see a fairly hostile world. Some of their strategy here makes complete sense, and, and indeed, 
maybe the word legitimate is where we get into some contested area, but certainly unexpected um, responses from Beijing. Um, there seems to be a bit of a, not necessarily tension, but a, a catch-22 here in many of the preemptive moves that we want to take to deter Beijing end up exacerbating its view of its security environment. Is that a tension we should try to resolve? Do we take into account Beijing's responses to this? Um, or is this one where Beijing has cried wolf too many times, it, it's, it's reacting to everything, so we just essentially need to push forward with our own security posture and, and have them a adapt to it? I mean, you've just described the fundamental dilemma of international relations in, in every age, right? And, and I think that uh, it's entirely appropriate to point out and uh, CCP observers have been quite candid in saying this for a long time, that when you look at any of China's uh, ambitions or the way that the CCP defines its interests, the United States stands squarely in its path, in its view, in, in every case, right? Maintaining the domestic control of the CCP, uh, reclaiming Taiwan and sort of reassembling the greater China that Xi Jinping seems to uh, envision, gaining primacy in Asia, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, and so it is, a lot of what they're doing is unsurprising. I guess the, the reason you've seen U.S. policy shift over the past four or five years is I think the perception in the United States, which would not be shared in Beijing, obviously, is that the United States tried a version of a reassurance strategy vis-a-vis -vis China for about 25 years after the end of the Cold War. And, and so it wasn't sort of a rollover and play dead strategy. The United States maintained its alliances in the Western Pacific. It maintained some pretty powerful military capabilities uh, in the region. And when China did things that the United States uh, deemed destabilizing, such as putting pressure on Taiwan in 1995, 1996, the United States pushed back. But I think that the dominant thrust of American policy, at least from our perspective, was bringing China into the international order and trying to show its leaders that they could become, their country could become prosperous, it could become influential, it could become well respected as a member of the existing order. And I think that the conclusion that American policymakers really came to in the mid-2010s was that that had not borne fruit. And so if, if it seems as though the United States is now uh, really leaning in the direction of resistance rather than reassurance, I think it's because they have that track record in mind. Yeah, and certainly the, the, the big fundamental shift in Chinese foreign policy, which is around that period of the global financial crisis, the United States did not have a particularly hostile foreign policy vis-a-vis -vis Beijing when, when we saw that, that, that big shift. And certainly it's, from Beijing's point of view, everything started and ended in 2016 with the election of Donald, Donald Trump. Um, but I think the, um, the, the lack of reflection of Beijing on, on how the U.S. is responding to uh, you know, initial negative overtures from, from Beijing is, is striking and, um, and worrying. If I can shift now a, a, a bit here now to the United States in terms of how we think about and formulate strategy, um, I was, as I was preparing for the event, I was um, reading the Walter Isaacson and Evan Thomas book, uh, The Wise Men, which is profiles of Dean Acheson and George Kennan, among others. And there was a line early in the book about how you could have important swings in foreign policy might be conceived of over cocktails at a party in Georgetown. Obviously, that was at a time of a, a, a fairly slimmed down national security bureaucracy compared to the United States. But there seems to be some corollaries between the flexibility of US policy then, given the low levels of bureaucracy, and to some extent, the ability of Xi Jinping to formulate policy given the level of control he has at least over foreign policy. He's not dealing with domestic politics to the extent that we are. He doesn't have anything like Congress. There are no opposition parties and you don't have to deal with um, elections and that seems to be an advantage. Can you talk about the difference in strategy formula formulation and implementation between the, the Cold War years, which I realize, you know, um, the bureaucracy grew over that time, but if we think about the late 40s, early 50s, um, what, what advantages did that give us and, and what are the barriers that we fundamentally or functionally uh, are facing now with a massive, massive bureaucracy? So uh, what was interesting about the 40s is it, it wasn't just that the national security bureaucracy was newer and slimmer, it was that the world was newer in a sense. And so when you came out of World War II, I mean, there was no international 
order, right? There was no legacy of U.S. global commitments and alliances, and so there was simply more scope to do things that were really radical and original, whether it was the Truman Doctrine or the creation of, of NATO or, or the Marshall Plan. Uh, and because the national security state was a bit newer, there, there was more scope to do that bureaucratically as well. The thing that's worth keeping in mind, though, is that you know, if you were, if we could get George Kennan and ask him about this, I think he would make a lot of the same points about sluggish bureaucracy from, from his own time. And so he, he was constantly frustrated that the State Department was not more agile and that his policy planning staff couldn't get greater purchase on the direction of American uh, foreign policy. It often found himself outmaneuvered by his opponents uh, in the bureaucracy. And so that problem has been around for a while. I, I, I take the premise that it is probably worse today in the sense that the bureaucracy is bigger and more entrenched. There's also a little bit less global scope for maneuver because you know, when we think about what it would take for the United States to compete effectively with China, we will have to invent some new things, but a lot of the things already exist. The network of alliances in the Western Pacific already exists. Uh, some of the institutions that the United States might use to rally resistance to you know, malign expressions of Chinese influence, the Group of Seven or whatever, already exist. And so it's not to say that we have everything we need, but the degree of creation that's needed today is probably less than it was in 1947. The last point I would make about this is, um, I, I guess I'm a little bit of a democratic triumphalist in the sense that I actually think that you know, checks and balances are a really good thing from the perspective of competitive strategy. And, and you can't help but think this if you studied the Cold War, I, I think. Because when you look at um, Stalin and the Soviet Union, or Mao and China, or the German Democratic Republic, what you realize is that having an absence of checks and balances is eventually fatal to good decision making. It, it reinforces the, the ideology and the romanticism of whoever's uh, in charge. It means there are no checks on bad ideas as well as no checks uh, on good ideas. And so while um, if you have a really enlightened autocratic ruler, uh, an authoritarian system might produce better performance for a while, you know, over the long run, I would go for a more sluggish, um, an inertia-filled system instead. Well, that's a great, um, maybe that's a nice segue to um, thinking about our, our strategy on China today. As you were describing some of the pathologies of autocratic or dictatorial government under Stalin or Mao, I thought you were going to continue on the list and say, and we're seeing that with Xi Jinping, um, uh, seeing that with Xi Jinping today. If, if we could think about a Cold War retrospective um, from the position of Russia, or if we were thinking about how Beijing might be looking at the Cold War from the other side, what do you think would be the lessons that a Beijing of today um, or a late era Soviet Union, if they still had some gas left in the tank to do a retrospective uh, revision of strategy, what do you think they're, what lessons should they be learning about how to rerun this better and different? Well, it's interesting. I think that the Chinese Communist Party learned three principal lessons from the Cold War, two of which it's basically forgotten today, for better or worse. And, and the first was the lesson that came from the fall of the Soviet Union, which was basically don't ever permit uh, much dissent within the party and don't ever permit liberalization movements to take hold because you never know where that will lead you. Uh, and I think that lesson was learned as early as 1989, uh, and it figured in uh, the events around uh, Tiananmen, which were occurring against the backdrop of a lot of ferment in Eastern Europe. Obviously, the Soviet Union itself had not uh, broken up and continue to inform it to this day. Xi Jinping still talks about the collapse of the Soviet Union as something that the party has to avoid. The second lesson was don't fight a Cold War with the United States. Uh, and so this was really what the hide and bide strategy was, was about. The idea was that it would be extremely dangerous to make an enemy of the United States. And so even if your interests were at odds with those of America, don't go out of your way to advertise that. And, and as you mentioned, I think that lesson started to be cast off back in about 2008 um, and, and with more speed since then. And we've seen it sort of on steroids since uh, COVID began. And then the third and related lesson was don't run a nuclear arms race uh, if you are going to compete with the United States. China maintained basically a, a minimalist nuclear deterrent uh, for several decades, that appears to be going out the window as well. If you look at DOD's projections, it's expected that China is going to be something like a nuclear peer to the United States uh, 
by the early 2030s. I, I think there are, you know, good strategic reasons for China to be doing this. They, they definitely want to avoid a scenario in which they feel that they can be coerced by escalatory threats from the United States in a crisis over Taiwan uh, or something of that nature. But it is striking the extent to which the Chinese Communist Party and Xi Jinping in particular seem to have decided either consciously or unconsciously that sort of the, the, the more um, circumspect approach that flowed out of their lessons from the Cold War is, is no longer needed. I think they're going to regret that over time. Um, thinking about the role of, you mentioned previously uh, just a moment ago about how you know, we've already, we didn't, we're not having to construct a network of allies, we, 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 we have one. I wanted to talk about the extent to which the array of multilateral institutions, alliances, um, sort of global governance that was in many ways built out of the, the period after World War II and throughout the Cold War, um, to what extent does that serve the purpose now in thinking about long-term competition? We have some newer institutions and bodies, the Quad, AUKUS, but those are sort of the exceptions to the rule. We're still, whether it's l looking at NATO right now, um, the United Nations, we're still sort of dealing with uh, um, architecture of, of the, the 20th century. So you say we sort of don't have to build as much because we have that, but I wonder if you could evaluate um, what does the toolkit look like for a, a really quite different competition in many ways? So the toolkit is obviously not ideal, or the toolkit, toolkit that we have anyways. And so if, if we could um, live in an ideal world, we would maybe have a NATO type organization in Asia and the Western Pacific so that it would you know, provide a big collective multilateral deterrent against Chinese aggression. There are good reasons why we don't have that rooted in history and, and geography. And what we have instead are the series of hub, hub and spoke alliances with particular treaty partners. Now, I think you can get a good deal of the way where you need to go with those things and then things you do to tie those various relationships together a bit more. I mean, that's essentially what the Quad does, right? It ties together um, a partnership with India and two, two alliances with Australia and Japan into a more multilateral body. AUKUS does something similar. Uh, and so I think what you see the United States trying to do right now is basically put together overlapping mini coalitions um, that have the combined effect of constraining Chinese power. And, and so I think if China is thinking about, um, you know, potentially starting a war over Taiwan, it makes a great deal of difference in Xi Jinping's mind whether he thinks he's fighting Taiwan in the United States or Taiwan, the United States, Japan, Australia, and a couple of other countries uh, as well. I think if we're looking at um, technological issues, semiconductors, for instance, you know, there's about four or five countries in the world that really matter from the perspective of semiconductor supply chains. Uh, and they're mostly democratic friends and allies of the United States. And so you can get a, a pretty good part of the way just by building on existing relationships that flowed out of the system that the United States built during the Cold War. They're going to have to be adapted. That's what you've seen with, with the Quad and AUKUS and other things. But in some ways, we have more of the uh, architecture there already than certainly was the case in, say, 1946. I wanted to ask you about the Russia-China. Um, I just was reading your, your most recent um, uh, Bloomberg column, which is about the, the lessons. And I, I like the way you framed it, just thinking about the connection between Ukraine and Taiwan. There, there had been a couple of weeks where I at least was getting frustrated by seeing pieces that were saying, you know, putting Ukraine and Taiwan in the exact same position. But as you mentioned in the, the piece, there's some dramatically different, you know, um, Japan is not Germany. Um, it's a dramatically different uh, um, uh, region. Beijing's calculations are different. The United States uh, positions and equities in Taiwan are very different than they are uh, in Ukraine. But I wanted to use that as a launching off point for um, thinking about the Russia-China relationship. If um, Russia and China were, were worried about and criticizing the United States for its Cold War mentality, the, the uh, statement we saw come out of, uh, of Moscow and Beijing and Putin's trip um, uh, would seem to be the wrong move if you were trying to move the United States away from a Cold War mentality. I wanted to ask how you see that relationship e evolving. This is one of those where I think even, even individuals who don't want this to be a Cold War are really going to be struggling because now, uh, with a potential of a of an axis between uh, 
Beijing and Moscow, this certainly uh, is rhyming more and more like a Cold War. But where do you see that relationship going? The benchmark now seems to be, well, they don't have an alliance. I wonder to what extent that, that's particularly relevant as you think about the future growth of the relationship. So I think the relationship is probably closer now than probably at any time since the late 1950s, right? since right before the Sino-Soviet split got going in earnest, and you're seeing growing material cooperation uh, on military issues, on economic issues, on diplomatic uh, issues. There's a very, the very important sort of signaling aspect of this, where Putin goes to meet with Xi before whatever he does or doesn't do in, in Ukraine. Um, and you actually don't need a formal alliance to get a lot of benefit out of this relationship if you are Russia or China. And so one of the interesting uh, factoids I heard recently is that the Russian Far East is uh, more denuded of military assets right now than at any time since 1941, when the Germans were on the verge of knocking the Soviet Union out of the war. And that testifies to the immense military and strategic dividend you get from not having to worry about your strategic rear. And so China obviously benefits from the same thing. And I think we, we worry a lot about um, ways in which China and Russia wouldn't necessarily intervene on each other's behalf if one of them got, got tangled up with the United States, but might find subtle ways of supporting each other through intelligence or military resupply or, or things of that nature. In, in some ways, the situation isn't that far apart from what it was in, say, the 1950s. And, and at that point, you know, the United States faced a similar problem of having two very powerful Eurasian adversaries that uh, had better relations with each other than they did with the United States. It was because both of them had deep-seated grievances with the United States and the international system it had constructed. Both of those things are true today. And, and as was true in the 1950s, I think the problem is that the United States really can't do a whole lot about it right now. If you're trying to follow you know, the, the Cold War parallel all the way to its conclusion, you would say, well, the United States should do the reverse Kissinger, right? It, it should make peace with Putin in order to peel him away from China. Putin has shown literally no interest in that. And he's made clear that the price just for turning down the temperature in the U.S.-Russia relationship, just for basically not invading Ukraine, would be to roll back NATO to its 1997 status and, and otherwise to really cripple the American position uh, in Europe. And so the, the price is simply too high for us to try to buy Putin off. And so I think the, the sad fact of the matter is that we are looking at you know, parallel competitions with Russia and China, which may even be merging, as I think your question indicated, as the two countries cooperate with each other more. To the extent that there's any good news here, it's that if you add up the U.S. plus its European allies plus its uh, allies in Asia, uh, they still weigh a lot more than Russia and China do together militarily, economically, and in other respects as well. Yeah. Uh, the interesting thing in the sort of Chinese discourse recently has been describing the relationship as, as back to back. In other words, you don't have to worry about your rear guard. You, you know, Russia, you face to the west and, and, and China can face um, out to its east, and, and even just that foundational agreement of I won't screw you if you don't screw, screw me actually goes a, a, a fair way for, for both in relieving some of the, the, the strategic uh, tensions they may have. Um, I, I now wanted to ask about um, shifting back to, to China now, and, and, but actually happy to include Russia as we think about this over the longer term. Um, uh, clumsily put, thinking about a vision of victory here. Um, absent a containment-like strategy that has a, a clear-ish conception of what we're working towards, uh, at least thus far articulated, um, we're talking more about process, a competition without having, at this point, defined what the finish line looks like. Um, does that matter? Um, do we need to think about what a, an end goal with China would be to be able to formulate a strategy? Um, is there a downside to having a prescriptive end, end state on this, or is that, in fact, the necessary prerequisite of any effective strategy? So I think it's important. I think it's also very fraught. And I think that you know one uh, discontinuity between the Cold War and the present is that by this stage of the Cold War, the U.S. government had already put forward its theory of victory in the Cold War. If you go back and read the X article, there's a very clear statement of how this ends. We, we contain the expression of Soviet power 
until the system mellows or uh, is toppled from within, essentially. You haven't seen anything quite like that today, and I think it's, it's for two reasons. One is that I think there's a genuine analytical debate about how, how competition leads to something better. And so I think the more optimistic view is that if you push back against Beijing uh, a bit in a bit sharper fashion, then over some number of years, you know, maybe a decade, you get to some sort of detente and, and you get to some sort of competitive coexistence where the countries are still rivals in a sense. They still compete economically and diplomatically, but they respect each other's vital interests. We don't worry a lot about a Sino-American war, kind of like the Cold War during the 1970s by the time you get to the peak of detente. The more pessimistic vision, I, I think, is rooted in the idea that there is something about uh, the Chinese Communist Party, there's something about the Chinese regime, particularly under Xi Jinping, that makes that sort of coexistence difficult. Uh, and perhaps because China's minimum definition of its vital interests uh, exceeds what we would be willing to grant it, perhaps because uh, a deeply illiberal system is just going to be very uncomfortable within an international system led by a democratic superpower. And if that's the case, you find yourself back in a little bit more of a Cold War situation where it would seem that this competition is going to go on so long as Chinese power doesn't fall off a cliff and so long as uh, the nature of the regime doesn't change in some way. That doesn't necessarily lead you to a regime change prescription. It may just lead you to sort of a sober realization that this competition isn't going to end anytime soon and, and you may sort of have to wait out the current version of the Chinese system. The second reason why I think we don't have clarity on this is that if you buy that second theory, it's deeply pessimistic and it's probably deeply alarming to a lot of the countries that we want to have on our side. Uh, and so if you go try to sell that in Southeast Asia, for instance, you're not going to get a lot of buyers right now. And so this is why I think that the U.S. government has been a little bit more circumspect in terms of trying to lay out that theory of victory. But I think it does have certain costs. I mean, it's, it's the equivalent of sort of setting out on a long journey without knowing mm -hmm. where you're trying to go. And as a, as a student of strategy and grand strategy, I, I find that a bit troubling. Yeah, and it seems that the, this administration in particular has had two, um, two challenging simultaneous tasks. Um, it's not only about articulating a China strategy, it's actually about defining the very nature of the relationship. And we seem to be in this liminal phase where it's, it's clearly no longer the relationship. The engagement, engagement as a paradigm no longer supports, and that's not only because of uh, Xi Jinping, but I think you saw, the, you saw this eroding even before. The, the glue of the relationship was not only an expectation of, of a pacification of China's system, but I think for most American citizens, it was an underlying idea that we benefited from economic engagement. But along with the collapse in the belief of globalization, of course, that kicked out the leg of one of the, the key planks. So, you know, I, I can understand how it's difficult to, in that, um, in that dusky period where we don't entirely know how to conceptualize the relationship, to then lay out a coherent China strategy. And that, to me, is an issue of, of, of politics here. Um, we, we're not ready to call it a rivalry and think about it on that terms. We also know we're you know, friend or frenemy doesn't work. And that's why I think you see this array of various descriptions, uh, strategic competition, competitive coexistence. Those make sense to me at some base level. But in terms of what an endpoint would be, I, 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 I don't know. And I wonder if this is, you know, for your thoughts on um, how do we move forward on this? Do we have to make that more painful, blunt, decisive choice about what the essence of the relationship is to move forward, or is this um, 1946 and we are kind of in those initial phases of feeling our way around and determining the extent of and the nature of, of the rivalry? Yeah, and you can see the dynamic that you talked about. I mean, we, we changed the adjective that we put before competition. You know, every few months it was extreme competition and then it was healthy competition. It'll be something else uh, in a couple of months. I, I guess I'm in favor of a bit more clarity here, in part because I just think that it's hard to mobilize the American system for competition unless you really clearly explain the stakes and explain what will be required to be successful. So if you go back to the early Cold War, uh, 
uh, and reread Harry Truman's speech to Congress in March 1947, uh, it's easy to forget that he w he was going to do that for a very specific purpose, was which was to get 400 million bucks in aid for Greece and Turkey, because he frames it in a much larger discussion of what's at stake in the international system and what the United States seeks uh, in the world, and, and puts it in terms of both interests and principles, because I think Truman understood that that was really the only way that you could get the American people to sort of face up to the challenge that was in front of them and keep them mobilized for the rivalry. And, and so I think there's an important dimension of that today. I don't, I don't mean to downplay the uh, diplomatic or the political sensitivities around defining a theory of success in this competition. And, and it is a complicated analytical question, but I think we, we probably don't do ourselves a whole lot of favors by deferring that discussion indefinitely. One of the things I took away from the book is just a, a better understanding of, um, to some extent it's misleading to call it the Cold War because you saw, as you just mentioned, with, with the, the, the essence of the Cold War in the 1970s was of course much different than we saw in 48, 49, 50, 51. Um, how might we be able to think about a, a, um, achieving some sort of version of the Cold War that is more of a 1970s detente than it is a late 1940s. Maybe another way of asking that is, what made detente possible, both in terms of choices that the United States made and choices the Soviet Union made, and, and, and is there any path we can find to a moderated Cold War, um, whereas now we seem to be very uncertain about how much of a Cold War this may be? Well, I guess the short and depressing answer is that we just need another Cuban Missile Crisis first, right? And so the, you know, detente had a variety of sources, but one of the reasons why the superpowers shifted toward a slightly less antagonistic, although still quite competitive relationship during the 1970s, is that they had gotten a glimpse of where unrestrained competition could take them in the Berlin crises and then in the Cuban crisis of the early 1960s, and it took a number of years, a decade really, to translate that sobriety into some of the diplomatic achievements that we associate with detente, the arms control agreements, uh, for instance, or the agreement basically to remove Berlin as a superpower flashpoint in 1971. But, but a lot of it did come from that uh, sort of terror at staring into the abyss and, and seeing what was down there. So. Uh, you know, sort of, if, if we, we expect the U.S.-China rivalry to follow a similar pattern, then we might think that there's going to be a period of jostling, a, a period of pretty sharp rivalry where the two sides test each other, probe each other's red lines, see where there's give in the other side's position before they get to some sort of more managed situation. I, I think that's actually fairly likely. I, I think that's clearly not the preference of American policymakers, and I think a lot of the people who are working in this administration are trying very hard, and for good reason, to, to avoid that. And so they are looking to put in place what they call guardrails on the U.S.-China relationship or isolate areas where America and China can cooperate on, on climate, for instance. We don't know yet how successful those efforts are going to be. I, I tend to think they may not be particularly successful just because when I look at the trajectory of, of Xi Jinping's China, I, I don't see it sort of, you know, settling down into a detente anytime soon. But I think the effort is at least worth it, so long as it doesn't distract us from the things that we need to do to protect our interests. So just, you just there mentioned um, Xi Jinping's China. So that, that gets into the, the next line of questioning. Uh, um, the extent to which leaders matter in these longer term competitions. Um, one of the, of course, with Kennan, it was the, the very essence of the Soviet political system, which was driving its revisionist and expansionist, um, you know, ambitions and global worldview. Uh, the CCP under, you know, under Xi Jinping, but previous leaders is, of course, different than uh, than the Soviet Union under Stalin, and yet there seem to be some pretty distinct overlaps, partly because they're building off the same governance architecture, but I wanted to ask if you could weigh into this discussion of kind of structure versus agency and thinking about this, um, and to put a fine point on it, um, let's say Xi Jinping has his, you know, has his Stalin stroke, um, you know, two years from now, um, what happens to this relationship? Um, do we see a, 
possible modulation of trajectory, or do you think the sort of fault lines here run deep enough to where whoever uh, replaces um, Xi Jinping might well continue on the same path? So I think some of it comes back to the question of whether you view Xi as the independent variable or the dependent variable. And uh, in some ways, I would say that, that he's as much the dependent variable as anything else. It's, it's not to downplay the, the role that Xi's personality and, and uh, his history and his ambitions have played in the relationship. But as you noted, the, the turn in Chinese foreign policy predated Xi Jinping. Right? It starts back in 2008, 2009. And we start to see a lot of the signs of what we might call a more assertive China back then. So there, there's clearly something deeper at some level that is driving the U.S.-China competition, whether it's shifts in the balance of power, the nature of the Chinese system, or, or whatever you, you prefer to think of as the cause. And so that's probably worth thinking about when we consider what might happen after Xi Jinping passes from the scene, whenever that that is, there, there are a wide range of possibilities after that happens, just in the way that the post-Stalin power struggle didn't have to come out in the way that it did. It didn't have to be Khrushchev, right, who, who ultimately came out uh, on, on top. And you could imagine alternative pathways if it was somebody else. Uh, and so it's possible that, uh, you know, if, if Xi Jinping runs the Chinese system into a ditch, then he has his Gorbachev uh, follow him. Uh, it's also possible, you know, that he has his Brezhnev uh, follow him, and, and when you get sort of more of the same. It's hard to predict, but, but given that I think there is something structural driving this, I think it would be uh, unwise of us to bank on Chinese policy changing dramatically after Xi Jinping dies. In the same way, it would be unwise of us to bank on Russian policy changing dramatically after Putin uh, passes from, from the scene. And so we, it, it would be great if we are pleasantly surprised and we get a much different Chinese regime after she uh, leaves office. But I, I think we should probably at least plan or operate on the assumption that the competition is going to outlast the next change of power. Yeah, and I wonder to what extent, um, given the speed with which Xi Jinping moved ahead with many of the, 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 the big changes we've seen in China's foreign policy, it feels as if many of these were, he was sort of implementing uh, deep consensuses which had emerged in the party after the experience of not just the global financial crisis, but a series of events and shocks which occurred between that critical time of around 2007 to 2012 color revolutions. China had its own domestic challenges which seemed to reinforce all of the worst party's instincts. You had internal party fights. Um, you, you had these sort of flashpoints where technology social media demonstrated the threat that these could pose to the regime. You had the Edward Snowden leaks. You had all these contingent events. So it feels like the right recipe here to understand this is sort of a bit of structure. Um, it's a bit of contingency, and it's a bit of an agency. Um, um, and, and those have all sort of come, come together now. Um, final question for you, which um, I should, probably should have left more time for because it's a critical one, which is, negative lessons to learn from the Cold War. We've been talking about what the Cold War teaches us, what we should do, how it helps us formulate strategy. You talk a lot in the Cold War about the pitfalls of this, um, the excesses. Um, so I wonder if you could just um, you know, wrap this up with what to you stand out as the salient red lights from that long period which we should be internalizing sooner than later so that we, we can avoid them. The biggest and in some ways the most obvious one is, is just to be cognizant of how much you are investing in competition, particularly at the periphery. And, and what the periphery is in the U.S.-China relationship may be different than what it was in the U.S.-Soviet relationship. But where we really got in trouble during the Cold War was in places like Vietnam, where we invested resources that were out of all proportion to the stake uh, at issue. And, and there will be temptations to do that here as well, because any time you get into an increasingly zero-sum relationship, there's a, a tendency to think that the other side's gain, wherever it may be, is going to be a significant loss for you. And, and that's often amplified by the fact that the United States is a global superpower, and so we worry that setbacks in one area will undermine the credibility of our commitments mm -hmm. in other. And, and those fears are not as baseless as uh, some academics think they are. But they can get you in a pretty tight spot if, if, you, let, if you let them. And so uh, one of the uh, lessons that comes out of the Cold War, which I, which I think is relevant here, uh, 
is to think about pacing yourself, right? And, and to think about developing strategies that are sustainable over time, that don't lead you to overcommit uh, in places uh, that are arg arguably of marginal significance. And, and in some ways, that's obvious advice, and it's, it's subjective. Uh, and so it still relies on a lot of good judgment. But I would want American policymakers to have that in the back of their minds. Well, Hal, um, we are perfectly at time, uh, as predicted. Um, again, want to recommend that um, folks go out and get Hal's new book, Twilight Struggle, What the Cold War Teaches Us About Great Power Rivalry. I should say that um, Hal is um, annoyingly prodigious and productive and has another book coming out uh, next year, which is on US-China uh, competition. So um, uh, a lot to look forward to from Hal or the army of secret minions he has writing in his basement, which actually uh, explains this productivity. But anyway, Hal, Hal, thanks for being here and, and congratulations on this excellent book. Thanks for having me. It was a lot of fun.